How you guys doing? We're talking about the Chicago Street Course today. I'm not going to touch Xfinity. However, my the same conclusion and my same approach will be used for Xfinity, but I won't talk about that race at all. This is mainly just focusing on the Cup Series at Chicago. And this is a video I've been waiting... Like, I, I couldn't wait till last year to make this video here because I think, uh, at least for me, like, watching the Chicago race was a perfect example of, man, I approached this the wrong way. I completely messed up Chicago and dumb lucked into making money. Absolute stupid luck. Uh, very similar to the case of, and this is where, you know, as a DFS player, you know, if you're truly, like, results-oriented of, like, where do you finish in the contest, I think you're limiting yourself of what you can learn from each of these contests and stuff. But, like, last week at Kansas, you need to understand, or not Kansas, Nashville, you need to understand how the slate changes and where you are or where you were in each of those situations. Like, straight up, if you're leaving Nashville of, like, man, what a chaotic race, Man, can't learn anything from that. Oh, man, you know, just uh, going to be crazy. Lost my retirement on that. Oh, well. You know, hey, what about that guy who bet Zane Smith is a top Chevy? And uh, Zane Smith is a top three. What a G. Like, you know, good for him. But what you really, like, the takeaway from Nashville should be, especially if you didn't play Christopher Bell. Like, if you, if you did not play Christopher Bell last weekend at Nashville, you played wrong. Like, you made a mistake. You should go over your stuff and look of like, why didn't I play Chris Bell? Was I blindsided by something that I have tunnel vision on something? Like if you didn't, ha if you didn't play Chris Bell, that should be the takeaway from Nashville. What did you do to not end up on Chris Bell? Like that's, that's the teaching point. You know, that's what it is. I feel bad. I mean, I played Bell too. Like I feel bad for everybody who played it correctly. You know, uh, you know, 25 or 23% owned Bell, uh, was, you know, the uh, the class of the field spins out DNFs, whatever. Okay, past that, then if you were cash at that point, you need to realize, like, hey, man, I got lucky. You know, I got bailed out, didn't have the guy who was going to kill the field. You know, it brings everything back into it. You know, place differential is now back in. You know, all, all the, like, the Kyle Busch, Logano uh, lines are, are coming back in. The Chastain lines are all coming in. Okay, so it was like, okay, acknowledge what happened we lost an unknown lap leader that was gonna pretty much suppress anybody out of potentially cashing if you didn't have bell at his ownership you know it's very much like mostly gonna be bell lines and then you know anywhere from like you know the bottom like 16 to into the cash line we're gonna be place differential uh lineups and then bell gets moved and those move up to the front and then we have you know the constant yellows and we lose kyle bush we lose chastain we lose bell you know then you know then it ends up with what we ended up at and so that's the way i think you should be analyzing every contest and that was oddly enough it lines up exactly of what i wanted to do with the chicago race last year of takeaways of like man i think this is how i should approach it man i think this is what should happen and so let's go ahead and kind of look into this and so last year's Chicago race, when I look at my lineups that I played, yet again, I cashed in these. And you see how much I left over uh, outside of the uh, Austin Dillon uh, line, because I, I know he wrecked towards the end of the race. But when I look at this approach, I am very concerned at doing this again. And I fully believe I played Chicago wrong last year. I really do. I don't think these lines had any respect, any 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 chance of truly cashing and stuff. I think I completely played Chicago wrong last year, and I'm and I'm absolutely not playing it like a place differential race this year at Chicago. I don't think it's that at all. And the reason being is so like here are the laps, and uh, I currently have it at lap 39. We'll talk about that later, but I will uh, I will move through, and we can look at the back of the field. So let me move this. This is where. We end up having the uh, the field end. Okay, so this is the end of the race, right? You know, we go to lap 78. We end up having uh, 31 cars on the lead lap. Several people are moved out. You know, Bowen blows a, a motor and stuff like that. And you're going to see that, yeah, you know, place differential came through. It, it all came down to strategy, you know, whatever the case may be and stuff. But when I look at this race here, I want to understand what led to guys being optimal, what led to, you know, people scoring the way they did and everything like that. And so when we look at this race here, when we look at last year's race, 
And I have it written down here, but at this point, I, I at least think I have it memorized. So last year's scheduled distance was 100 laps. This year, it's 75. Okay, now with where a lot of the field was at, okay, the main leaders, and yet again, that's why I had it, uh, where's, where's Bowman? Where does Bowman drop to? That's why I had it on lap 39, because at this point, we had had some yellows and stuff, but, and some guys pitted and stuff, but the main plan for the leaders was to stay out until lap, what I have, 62? Uh, I can't, sorry, my camera's in the way. The leaders, the main guys who were competing to be optimal in this race, okay? Yet again, place differential lineups were not working. Green flag starts, not working, not working, not cash, not cash, not doing anything, 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 absolutely donating, absolutely doing nothing, doing nothing, and then bam, place this place differential comes through in the back of the field. Um, and like we need to understand what happened there and why it happened. And so uh, Bowman blows a motor or transmission, whatever, doesn't matter at this point. Uh, he has a mechanical issue, DNFs, brings out a yellow, okay? At this point, you know, yeah, you, you can argue that, oh, the team should realize we're racing the darkness. Look, I mean, these teams are dumb as fuck anyway, okay? Like, uh, look at all the idiots running people out at Nashville. Like, uh, these teams are not the best strategists and stuff, especially when it's uh, possibilities of what's going to happen, okay, of when things are going to happen and whatever. So this yellow comes out. NASCAR has not relayed to the teams that they are going to call the race anytime soon, okay? So the first time pits are open, okay, we do not have any of the lap leaders, any of the people competing to be optimal, any of the people that I think should have finished up front who had the best cars, okay? And you could argue that, yes, it was difficult to pass, but we do see people like SVG, you know, pits and goes up through the field like if you had a fast car at this track, which... Not putting a lot of stake into it, but I mean the practice lap. I mean you know Jensen you know ran issues and stuff, but for the most part, top five averages was pretty consistent with where people at least fell in, at least the top portion of the field and the bottom half of the field. Okay, I don't think um, practice data is something that we necessarily want to weigh a ton on. I think your starting position and, and, you know, certainly, you know, like, I mean, you're not going to start for any if you don't have a fast car. It's going to be pretty easy to determine who has a fast car and who doesn't have a fast car in practice and qualifying. But I think there is a pretty big discrepancy in terms of the guys who had the top half speed and bottom half speed when we look at last year's race and we relay it back to where the race was going. And so when we're at this point in the race, you know, a lot of guys are, uh, who are, who should compete to be up front are not pitting because they're like, we got to make it to our number 62. We're racing the lap 100. You know, are we raised? Are we going to enter in uh, whatever? And so first lap pits are open. We have William Byron, uh, Harvick, Sindrick, if I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure Harvick is one of them. Yeah. So we have a ton of guys who, you know, go into pit lane because they got like nothing, n- nothing going on. You know, uh, Gregson's having a terrible time. And so we have very few guys, but we have, you know, a handful of them pit under the first time the, the pit lanes are open, okay? Because um, they're like, we got to get off strategy. We got to think of something. And so, like, you know, Dylan, uh, Elliot, and stuff like that. So these guys pit, okay? We continue to go. We get, we pace for four more laps. No clue why we're pacing so long. Just, you know, NASCAR just likes pissing away laps. Anyway, lap 46 as they're on the back straightaway, NASCAR relays to the team, we are shortening the race. Okay, we are shortening it, it, it to lap 75. Ironically, we end up going over that distance. We go to 78. But NASCAR relays, hey, we are shorting the race. And at this point, if you remember, maybe you don't, all the teams are big pissy. They're very upset. They are very mad because... Why didn't NASCAR relay that before the pit lanes were open the first time, okay? These guys in the back of the field pitted, just trying to get off a sequence, you know, in case we were going the distance or whatever, but they inadvertently helped them gain a ton of positions here, okay? So that's why you see, you know, people like Logano, who was in, you know, 17th, 15th, they pit, they end up coming out in the top five. These guys end up taking over the top five positions. Haley ends up taking over a top five position, ends up becoming the leader because they pitted under the first time the yellow or the first time pits were open nascar relays that information late to the real leaders like completely screws them over okay so they all pit here okay and so 
when I'm looking at this Chicago race, okay, I'm honestly looking at how do I build to build correctly, which I think is, is more so lining up with where people were at here. Now, it's not a perfect science. We don't have true, um, you know, like I, I don't have the fast laps and the laps led for this point. But at this point in the race, on lap 39 before the yellow comes out, this is where people are scored at. Okay, and so yes, and you, we, we can argue, you know, semantics and stuff. Like there has been yellows, there has been pitting, there has been, you know, stuff like that. And so this isn't a concrete of where people were. But at this exact moment on lap 38, this is where people are scored fantasy-wise, okay? And so when we look at this, okay, and I look at where my lines were, okay, when I see like these builds... I can tell you right now, I'm not anywhere near cashing. I'm not doing a damn thing, okay? Yet again, as we've seen, you know, Chastain got off sequence, he pitted, and so, you know, you know, not a perfect science here, but this is one thing that I like doing, and this is no different than keeping up with the live scoring during the race of being aware of where people are scoring. Now, Gregson's having a terrible day. He's hit turn six like seven times, but... Where are the top 10 guys performing right now? Like Jensen, no surprise that he's struggling, okay? We're not expecting that. Logano, you know, we can kind of cross-examine and see how close we are here. But Logano, mid-tier, five-lap average in practice and stuff. And so you would, and we can even look at, go ahead and just take it, Gander, and look at all these guys. And so, yeah, sure, Jensen was fast, but also not used to racing with NASCAR guys. And so we can, my keyboard died. And my keyboard died. Give me a moment here. Give me a moment. There we go. Um, Jensen Button, you know, hindsight very much being got ran over in all in all the cup races that he was in, just because he didn't have that grip, that that grit, that determination to stay up there. And so, you know, not a surprise. Logano, mid tier speed, not a surprise that he technically fell out of the top ten. Uh, when we look at Jensen and and Logano being the two main guys in the top ten who fell out. Now, you can argue of like, well, I'm not going to play AJ at 36. I, at least for me, this is this is helping me understand how I want to play. And before everybody's like, oh, my God, SVG is the greatest guy ever. Man, he came out of nowhere and won this race. Like, how how is SVG doing before this happened? I mentioned it in the live show the other day of like restarts and where people were out of restarts and like why that data can be skewed on certain things. SVG gets through the lap cars of the guys who are slower, faster than everybody else. But before that fell back to fourth, fell back to fifth, you know, and I'm not saying he wasn't the best car. He was certainly a top five car here, but you know, he's not seeming like, you know, the greatest driver since, you know, Richard Petty and stuff, but he, he is in fifth. And so when we're looking at where people are scored here, where are the majority of those guys coming from? They're coming from the top half of the field, okay? Yes, you know, yet again, I understand all the caveats of, of taking this data point from, a, not I mean, not a random lap, but taking it from a lap and seeing where everybody scores at this point here. You know, some people can argue that's helpful. Some people can argue that it's not. But when I look here and I'm like, how do, how do I play this differently this year? I'm probably going to start playing a lot more guys in the top half of the field than I did last year. And the only time that I probably want to focus on place differential, which at this point I'm, I'm looking back at how I approached, I'm not mad about that. Uh, I mean, I could argue that Harvick, pro I mean, I could argue that I was probably too high on all these guys. Like Haley, I had no right being this high on Haley and him working out like that. I think that was a pretty big mistake. But Chastain, um, Elliott, Byron, let you know, play the good guys in the back. I'd probably limit my exposure to place differential only to good cars in the back of the field, okay? Um, and for the most part, we're going to see, and this is another thing of like, oh my gosh, where does value come in? Where does people, score? this is where the scoring is on this specific lap. Yet again, minus fast laps or laps led at that point. But look how close people are scoring across the board, okay? This is going to be a low scoring contest, low scoring slate. So, A, people are going to approach it like Daytona to where they chase the place, the place differential play. And I don't even know if that's a guarantee of coming through, to be honest with you. Now, we do have weather in the area for Chicago. Could be a gigantic mess. Uh, personally, I would just play light anyway. Like, this is just a wash week. You know, yet again, just start kind of moving over money for Daytona uh, uh, next month. Because we only have three races this month, three races next month. Okay, so, like, maybe just, you know, kind of kick this money on down the line. Don't just dump a ton of money into Chicago here, 
But notice how close people were scoring, you know? And so raw points of guys running up front, you know, you're going to be like by default, High 30s, mid 40s, if not, you know, high 40s, depending on who you are. But for the most part, the place differential, the good place differential will need help coming through because you will be scoring in the 30s, in the 20s and stuff. And so for me, when I'm looking at this race, I think when I look back at Chicago last year, I played Chicago wrong. I absolutely played it wrong. And I got saved by NASCAR fucking over the top half of the field because these guys are racing for a real race. NASCAR shortens it, completely changes. And so when we leave this aspect of that, you know, we'll just move over to like lap 47. This is where we're at. You know, look at all the guys who gained positions who had no right being up there, who had no business being up there, you know. Actually, I think this is during the pits. This is probably the, the restart because Haley takes over the lead. So let me go to the first green flag lap, and we just, we see a distinct change here of, like, all the guys who didn't do anything all day automatically in the top ten. And so by this point in the race, all the place differentials moved up, and, you know, it kind of solidifies, like, that type of approach. Even guys in the back of the field um, who, like, had good cars. Like, you got to remember Denny fucked on the first lap. Absolute baboon. Or second lap, rather. Fell to 12th, but, I mean, this just solidifies him of really not even being in play. You know, this, this solidifies a lot of guys who start up front just not, you know, being able to really do much because I believe Busher starts 12th or 14th. He starts 15th and stuff. And so, like, being aware of how the scoring changes in a race is is probably the most important thing that I think you need to realize and know. I mean, Dylan, absolute slam dunk play until he fucking hits the goddamn wall. Um, you know, but, like... And and this isn't including the big one that happens after this, of uh, you know the big pileup and stuff. Which honestly, I don't think that's going to happen. I really don't. Last year, starting a monsoon track dried out. People got aggressive. People understood. Oh my God, we're racing to the we're racing the lap seventy five. We got to go. People are racing really aggressive. I I I don't think it's going to be that way this year. I just I really don't. Um, at least a big one, chaotic stuff like that. I just don't think it's going to be that way. Yeah, sure, we're going to have guys hit hit walls, hit tire barriers and stuff, but still, I don't think it's going to be as chaotic as, as, as it was last year. And so when I'm thinking out loud, when I'm thinking of how I want to approach Chicago, I'm not going to go overboard on place differential. I'm not just going to stack the back like a plate track or something like that. I really don't want to do that. I think I'm going to primarily focus on top 15 drivers, and certainly top 10 drivers, and then good guys in the back. So whether it be like a Hendrick guy in the back, uh, uh, and even even still, like let's remember this year, we've seen good teams in the back at these at these uh, road courses struggle getting up through the field, you know? And so like even then, what is a good guy in the back, you know? We can't just necessarily be like, oh, there's a Joe Gibbs car in the back, I'm going to play him. Like it's good guys in the back for me mean people who are showing uh, at least – you know, top 20-ish speed and top five averages from the practice sessions on Saturday. That is my approach and my thoughts on Chicago. Um, and even still, probably play light. Like, who who, who really cares, man? It, it's Chicago. we got three races this week. Let's, let's actually put our money uh, to, you know, um, let me make sure we get to this year. Let's actually put money towards places like Pocono. Okay, which we could just take all the 1.5 data and look at uh, and in Indianapolis later this, you know, in, in two weeks to where I would I would argue 1.5 plus whatever we end up seeing in practice if we think it's going to be crazy or chaotic, whatever. But Pocono and Indianapolis in the next two weeks, like that's what I would focus on more than this Chicago race. Uh, same thing applies with Xfinity. I think I'm going to play a lot of guys who start up front in Xfinity um, and or good drivers. Main, mainly by that meaning cup drivers that might start towards the back of the field or whatever. But that's where I'm at, and uh, that's my preview for Chicago. I'll be live Saturday and Sunday. Um, schedule of when it's going to happen is going to be permitted with where we are in terms of the Chicago um, schedule. Like, the schedule's already out, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure what time I'm going to be going live Saturday, probably going to be an afternoon. Sunday, I'll be live early morning. Um, 
but yeah, that's it. That that's my thoughts on Chicago, and uh, that's where that's kind of where I'm at. So thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys later.